This monster is the messenger of hell guiding lost souls. He leads the man into the first level of hell, making him endure torment for 40 centuries. Hell is filled with guilty souls, like this girl, who actually burned her own sister alive by luring her into a microwave. But the man believes he hasn't committed an unforgivable sin. Why has he been thrown into hell to endure torment? The story begins a few days ago. The protagonist, Jason, suddenly wakes up in the middle of the road. He sees a scrapped car by the roadside. Jason hasn't figured out the situation yet. A man behind him suddenly speaks up. After a brief exchange, Jason remembers that he just experienced a car accident. He encountered a motorcycle head-on while making a turn. Jason swerved too much, causing the vehicle to flip. But the motorcycle rider had an even worse fate. Both him and his bike rolled off a cliff. What surprises Jason is, both of them clearly experienced a severe accident. Why doesn't he have a single scratch on his body? The motorcycle rider Michael had already guessed the truth. It tells Jason that they are actually already dead. They should be in a spiritual state now. Naturally, Jason refuses to accept this explanation. He just got a promotion and raise. A wonderful life is right in front of him. How could he suddenly die without any reason? Michael chuckles upon hearing this. He asks Jason to take a look inside the car. Jason refuses to cooperate and angrily curses Michael as crazy. Michael doesn't defend himself. He drags out a corpse from the car. Jason turns his head and takes a glance. The corpse indeed looks exactly like himself. He wants to make a final struggle. Jason questions Michael. If you're also dead and without a physical form, how can you touch the corpse then? Michael is also clueless about this. At that moment, Jason sees a car approaching slowly. He rushes forward to remind the driver to call for help. Perhaps his own body can still be saved. But the driver seems unable to hear him. The driver takes out a wallet from the corpse jacket and leaves without even looking back. Jason's last shred of hope is completely shattered. Since the driver can see or hear him, it means Jason is truly dead. On the other hand, Michael remains much calmer. Since one can become a spiritual entity after death, then the legends of heaven and hell must truly exist. Michael is grateful that he has never killed anyone. He is certain he will go to heaven. Meanwhile, Jason's face becomes even paler. His wife had a terminal illness. To end her suffering, Jason cured her with his own hands. Does this mean Jason will go to hell? At that moment, Michael suddenly hears music playing. Surprisingly, a pure and pristine door appears nearby. What terrifies Jason is, he doesn't hear gentle music. The sound Jason hears is a horrifying scream. Behind him, a crimson iron door appears. Could this be the entrance to heaven and hell? Michael believes it's highly likely, because everyone has their own destination after death. This makes Jason even more panicked. He killed his wife to free her from suffering. He shouldn't be going to hell. Michael advises him not to be naive. Killing is killing. Hell has a place for him. After saying that, he walks towards the pure white door. Unexpectedly, Jason sprints forward. He actually passes Michael and rushes into the white door first. Nothing happens as a result. Michael is also startled. Fortunately, the white door is still there. He sarcastically remarks that Jason is indeed not a good person. Jason immediately tries to defend himself. You were riding a motorcycle in the wrong direction. You indirectly caused my death. However, Michael doesn't think so. He changed lanes earlier too. Avoid a little girl playing by the roadside. After a brief farewell between Michael and Jason, he prepares to go to heaven. But when Michael steps through the white door, again, nothing happens. He thinks he didn't enter correctly and tries again, but there's no change. While the two are puzzled, a little girl suddenly appears nearby. She immediately recognizes Michael as the person who hit her with the motorcycle. The two men exchange glances. Since the little girl can't see them, it means she is also in a spiritual state. Michael's face changes drastically. He thought he had avoided the girl. Could it be that he actually killed her? This would explain everything. The white door is prepared for the little girl, and both of them should go to hell. Jason comes up with an idea. He tries to persuade the little girl to go with him. Maybe he can enter heaven along with her. To their surprise, the little girl screams in fear, because she believes that neither Jason nor Michael are good people. Michael can't stand it anymore. He picks up the little girl and throws her into the gate of heaven. The gate and the girl indeed disappear together. Michael feels that the destination has been predetermined. It's not something their tricks can change. After Michael finishes speaking, he resigns himself and walks towards the gate of hell. Just as he's about to step in, Michael becomes somewhat fearful. Jason lifts his foot and gives him a push, directly kicking Michael into the gate. But when it's Jason's turn, he also lacks the courage. But now there's no one to kick Jason. He stands outside the gate, 
attempting a final explanation, hoping someone will hear his explanation, perhaps because it took too long. Suddenly, a black mist rises nearby. Jason knows he can't wait any longer. He steals himself and rushes into the crimson iron gate. In just an instant, Jason finds himself in a great and misty world. The ground is filled with withered corpses. Could this be the legendary hell? Jason approaches a corpse. As he bends down, a large amount of information suddenly floods his mind. Jason unexpectedly glimpses the memories of the deceased. The girl's name is Jenny. Her parents constantly fought, which made her character extremely solitary. Her mother not only failed to communicate and guide her, but also punished Jenny for her mistakes and kept a record of them all. For example, squeezing small animals to death, hurting younger siblings, among other things. Jenny appears to be young, but her mentality is very mature. Jenny pretends to humbly correct herself to her parents. On a quiet midnight, she directly stabbed her sleeping parents. The next morning, early, Jenny calmly finished her breakfast. As if nothing happened, she went to her dimly lit basement. To her surprise, there was a terrifying monster living there. But she wasn't surprised. She casually told the monster, I've killed my parents as you instructed. We can't leave the basement now. After the little girl finished speaking, the two of them arrived in a sunny hall. The monster was delighted with everything here, and Jenny was even happier. She casually played with her mother's cosmetics and jewelry. If it were before, she wouldn't dare touch the girl's belongings. Next, the two of them had to deal with the bodies of her parents. Fortunately, the monster was strong. Jenny enjoyed herself on her parents' large bed, while directing the monster to stuff the bodies under the bed. After they finished tidying up, the two of them had lunch together. Suddenly, the doorbell rings outside. It turns out to be a delivery for the mother. Jenny tells the delivery person that her parents are not home, but an adult is required to sign for the package. The little girl can only ask the monster for help, but she shouts for a long time without any response. Jenny searches the hall, but doesn't find the monster. Finally, she finds the terrifying monster in the bedroom. In reality, the so-called monster doesn't exist. He is only a projection of Jenny's inner self, but the girl seems unaware of the truth. Under the influence of the monster in her mind, Jenny tricks her own sister into the oven. Thick black smoke gradually spreads. The entire house catches fire. After Jason finishes watching the girl's life, he instinctively goes to another corpse. This deceased person's past life was a lawyer. The lawyer was busy with work all the time. She was unaware that her daughter was often bullied, although her daughter had mentioned it many times. But the mother ignored her daughter. She went to help other victims engage in a lawsuit. Her daughter felt incredibly ironic about it. She helped so many people, but ignored her own daughter. She couldn't bear it anymore, and chose to end her own life. When the lawyer returned home, she saw her daughter's lifeless body. She realized how foolish she had been. The lawyer couldn't accept the fact that her daughter was gone. She thought of her daughter's greatest wish, which was to see the sunrise at the beach. So, she actually drove to the nearest beach with the body. As a result, the lawyer became distracted. Her car crashed into a tree by the roadside. The poor mother couldn't fulfill her daughter's wish. She even lost her own life. Meanwhile, Jason finally realizes, could it be that the souls here haven't dissipated, but instead lie dormant with painful memories? Fortunately, he has no regrets in his life. His only act of murder was to free his wife from suffering. He decides to lie down here. Jason patiently awaits the decay of his body. But at that moment, an illusory figure suddenly appears. The figure claims to be a messenger from hell. Jason quickly defends himself, claiming innocence. But the messenger ignores it completely. He is only responsible for redeeming the souls of the wrongdoers. After the messenger finishes speaking, he leads Jason through a doorway. It turns out that this is the first level of punishment in hell. Jason will endure extreme pain in the room for 4,000 years. Only after completing this step will he be qualified to lie flat. Jason was about to ask where the pain comes from, when the messenger from hell abruptly disappears from the room. As he turns around again, a muscular monster stands up from the ground. Excitedly, he rushes forward and brutally beats Jason. The monster's strength is incredibly powerful. It actually beats Jason's soul to death. According to the rules of hell, after a person's soul consciousness dissipates, they will be reincarnated in another life. But the messenger from hell refuses to relent. He orders the pig-headed monster to go to the human world to capture the recently reincarnated Jason. His four thousand years of painful punishment is not yet over. He cannot be reincarnated too soon. So, the pig-headed monster appears before the reincarnated Jason. His painful punishment has only just begun. 
That's the entire content of Pandemonium. The first half of the movie is filled with suspense, and there's a sense of dark humor. It keeps people interested to continue watching, until Jason enters hell. The story becomes boring. The setup from the first half is left unexplained. Instead, two unrelated short stories are inserted. A girl playing a make-believe game with a monster after killing her parents, and a girl who commits suicide after being bullied at school. The connection between the three storylines is not natural. It feels like three short films first together. The more it progresses, the more confusing it becomes. The ending is rushed and sloppy. It feels like the screenwriter wanted to express something unrelated to mainstream religion, but rather a pure theory of good and evil. When considering each character in the drama, whether it's Jason, who helped his wife escape from suffering, or Michael, who accidentally killed a girl, or the lawyer who advocates for justice, but neglects his family. In a certain sense, they are not purely evil, but after going to hell, they are immediately judged as guilty, and have to endure punishment for 40 centuries. A hell here, and most is just an embodiment of the right to reward good and punish evil, with a utilitarian purpose. In other words, it is used to scare people not to do evil. The result of hell's abuse toward sinners without trial is the birth of anti-Christians, and that's how the devil came into the world. Human nature is complex, no one can judge whether others are good or bad. The only thing we can do is to summarize and repent for the sins of our lives. After all, no one can claim to be completely innocent. Death is not redemption, but a way of forgetting. Of course, these are just subjective opinions regarding the movie itself. It can only be seen as an abstract drama. Otherwise, it feels like the story ends without being fully told.